Hello to all our deadly friends, and welcome to Dead to Rights, the podcast for readers, writers, and everyone in the book industry. I'm your host, Donna Carrick. Today we've got a terrific show lined up. We've got an interview with Rob Brunet, author of the hit novel, Stinking Rich. Rob brings us insights into his novel, as well as great tips for newbie writers. Also, I'll read you a story from my North on the Yellowhead collection titled Dancing with Carole, a dark little tale of a teenage girl who discovers her family life is several layers darker than even she had imagined. Before we get to that, I want to talk to you about this art we call literature. If you want to cut hair for a living, you attend beauty school. If you want to be a teacher, you enroll in teacher's college. Likewise, if you harbor aspirations of the written arts, you need to hone your knowledge and skills accordingly. I can't speak for other publishers, but as a small, independent publisher, I receive a lot of manuscripts that can only be called subpar. Authors, you may well have a terrific story to tell, but if you don't want to make the effort to learn your craft, then that and a buck seventy-five will buy you a premium cup of coffee. When you approach Carrick Publishing, we expect you to have already enlisted the help of a professional editor. If you haven't done that, then talk to us. We can offer a copy edit, but we don't have the staff to perform substantive edits or even rewrites, which is what is needed in far too many cases. I'm not in the business of crushing dreams. Much of the arts is purely subjective. We know that. However, it's obvious to anyone in the industry whether or not an effort has been made. If you submit a 66,000-word manuscript in painfully long paragraphs with repetitive words and phrases, you may not be able to discern the problem, but believe me, anyone in the book industry will know that you have not had the training required to write well. On a lighter note, the world is cascading down its own special rabbit hole, even as we speak. I've decided it's important to pick a side. So, with my tongue firmly placed in my cheek, let me announce that I, Donna Carrick, am rooting for Stormy. Are you a published author? If so, we'd love to share your story with our listeners. Contact me at carrickpublishing at rogers.com and in the subject line say, Schedule me for an interview. My own personal love is for the crime genre, but I do have a passion for all of the literary arts, so we're open to interviewing authors from a wide spectrum of styles. And now, I hope you'll enjoy my reading of Dancing with Carole from North on the Yellowhead and Other Crime Stories, Carrick Publishing, 2016. Dancing with Carole by yours truly, Donna Carrick. A statue of the Blessed Virgin graces the highway just outside of town. As children, we seldom paid attention to it. It was just there, a part of the landscape we took for granted. She's a lovely lady, though, standing as she does on the edge of the forest. Her robe is blue, and her head covering is gilded ivory, both of which make striking contrasts against the backdrop of evergreens. Occasionally we would notice a light in her halo had burnt out, or someone had left litter at her base. Locals from our town were quick to correct the problem, to change the bulbs or clear the trash, all in honor of her holiness. Once, though, during the infamous FLQ crisis, Our Lady witnessed a rare spot of drama. A local child had gone missing. Her body was found some days later, torn and mangled, abandoned behind Mary's flowing skirts. According to reports, the abduction was sexually motivated. Our town was especially shocked, given the tender age of the victim. It was not a political crime, but set against the tension of those emotional days, her murder served to heighten local anxiety. We children were warned by parents and teachers not to wander off, and above all, not to talk to strangers. To see St. Marie posed so tenderly, you wouldn't guess she stood guard over more than just trees and sky. 
Our town is well hidden, marked only by a turning off from the main road. Blink, and you're sure to miss it. We were a thousand souls at any given count, including a handful of families on the surrounding farms who took their mail at our post office. All francophone, except for our family, and all decidedly R.C. We were a family of four, Dad, Mom, my younger sister Stephanie, and me, Ruth. I was seventeen at the time, and Stephanie was fifteen. Our only close neighbors, Carole and Jean-Paul, had two preschool children. Jean-Paul would make a rink for them in winter. In summertime, our families would sometimes hike together down the dangerous escarpment to the river. When the water was low, the reddish sand would yield clams by the bucketful. Carole and Jean-Paul were younger than our parents. They couldn't have been more than 25 years old. They loved to drive into the city to visit with friends, and often they would ask me to babysit. They paid well, and their kids were well-behaved, so I didn't mind. Besides, it was a welcome chance to get out of the house. It was springtime, and Carole had asked me over for 5 p.m. She and Jean-Paul were meeting friends for dinner, then heading to the town hall for the annual spring dance. They were protective of their little ones, especially after a second child had gone missing earlier that week. Another girl, a six-year-old, had disappeared while walking home from school. Jean-Paul was late getting home from work, so Carole and I sat together trading stories. She told me about her teen years in an all-girls Catholic school. She shuddered as she recalled being terrorized by nuns and laughed in embarrassment at her own naivete regarding the opposite sex. I knew nothing, she said in perfect English. I didn't even know what menstruation was. I remember when I started my first period, I was sure I was dying. The nuns told me, stay away from boys, and they sent me home to talk to my mother. Mother gave me a box of pads and one of those belt things and told me the nuns were right. I had to stay away from boys from then on. I shook my head in disbelief. I met Jean-Paul one afternoon when I went to the movies with a group of girls. He smiled at me and I panicked. I knew I had to stay away from him. When we married, he was shocked at how little I knew. He told me not to worry. He would be gentle. I cried, of course, mostly out of shame at my own stupidity. I made sympathetic sounds, and we laughed together. It felt very grown up being there with Carol, who wasn't much older than I was, discussing adult things like sex and marriage. I didn't confide my own experiences, though. They would have upset her. She was a sweet lady, little more than a girl herself, who kept a clean home and liked to talk about makeup. Jean-Paul arrived with a loud hello, apologizing for his lateness. I see you're already here, he said to me. His English was not as good as his wife's. My French was on a par with his English, so I couldn't complain. You're looking very pleased with yourself tonight, Ruth, he said. I hear from your mamma you scored well on your exams this term. Yes, thank you, I said. Where did you see Mom? She was at the store, Jean-Paul said. She and your father are going to the dance tonight at the town hall. I expect we'll see them there after dinner. Will Stephanie be home alone? No, she's babysitting for the LeBlancs tonight. I guess everyone will be at the dance, Carol said. I smiled. Mom had been looking forward to the annual event. She'd bought a new dress, which was unusual, since she was normally frugal, a lovely peacock blue that set off her dark hair and reflected her eyes. We'd better get on the road, Carol said. We'll be late for dinner. I'll shave and change my shirt, Jean-Paul said. Ruth, there are dinners in the fridge for you and the kids. Just warm them for 45 minutes at 3.50. And remember, keep the doors locked. A reminder of the recent murder of a five-year-old girl and the six-year-old who'd just gone missing, 
as if a community like ours would ever forget something like that. Will do, I answered. Speak as much English as you can, she said. They need to practice. Adrienne is improving with your help. I smiled. I enjoyed teaching the little ones to speak English. They learned so quickly at that age. Jean-Paul emerged from the hall, clean and dashing, and ready to dance. Have fun, you guys, I said, locking the door behind them. Come on, mes enfants, I said to the kids. Let's put dinner in the oven and watch cartoons on the English Channel. It was 11.30 when I heard their car doors shut in the driveway. I turned down the stereo, expecting them to be right in, but it was a couple of minutes before the key turned in the front door. Bonsoir, Jean-Paul said. Is everything all right here? Yes, I said. The kids were great, as usual. They went right to bed after murder, she wrote. How was the dance? It was wonderful, Carol said, but her eyes didn't look happy. I could have danced all night. Yes, well, my dear, you will have to dance alone. I'm fatigué. It's bedtime for me. Stay a while, Ruth, Carol said, turning up the volume on the stereo. The Supremes belted out their best material. You don't have to hurry. Dance with me before you leave. That was an odd request. Surely my parents would be home already if the dance was over. They would wonder why I was late. They might worry, knowing a child murderer was on the loose, although I realized I was no longer a child and hadn't been for some time. Carol took my hand and led me to the center of the floor. You girls have fun, Jean-Paul said, but he didn't smile. He shook his head and disappeared down the hall. We danced for three numbers, then Carol stood to change the record. She tilted her head to one side, straining to listen to the silence between songs. Hearing nothing, she turned the stereo off. I guess you'd better go home, she said. I'm planning to stay up late tonight. If you and Stephanie feel like joining me for a movie, feel free to knock on the door. The strangeness of her comment was not lost on me. I liked Carol, but she was certainly in an odd mood. I wondered if she'd had too much to drink. I sighed, reaching for my coat in the hall closet. Going home was not something I looked forward to. I never knew what I would find there, especially if Dad was in his cups. I pulled my coat around my shoulders. It wasn't a long walk, but it was cold outside. Our house lights were on. We usually used the rear door, so I hurried up the driveway to the backyard. Ruth! A voice hissed at me from behind the garage. I jumped. Stephanie, for God's sake, what are you doing out here? I got home a half an hour ago, she said. They were fighting again. I'm afraid to go in. Damn, what did he do this time? It was awful. You must have heard the yelling. It stopped about five minutes ago. I've been waiting for you. I didn't hear anything. I was playing music. Carole and Jean-Paul were the only neighbors within hearing distance. They must have known about the fight. That's why Carole kept me back, dancing to the Supremes, so I wouldn't walk into a war zone. I'm going in, I said. But Ruth, I've got to. I have to make sure she's all right. Besides, I added, it's quiet now. I'm coming with you. You should stay here till I call you. No. I opened the door and listened. Nothing. Then our mother called out. Is that you, Ruth? Stephanie? Come into the kitchen. We hesitated, but only for a minute. She was sitting at the table, a late-night cup of tea in front of her. He was nowhere to be seen. She had a mark on her face, but it wasn't the worst bruise I'd seen on her. She'd been crying. Her eyes were red, but she was calm. Go to bed, both of you, she said. We're leaving in the morning. Don't tell him. He thinks we've made up. Pack only what you need, one bag each. The minute he leaves the house, we go. What if he doesn't leave the house, I asked. He's curling with the clochets at ten. He'll leave by 9.30. We heard his footsteps in the hall, and Mum put her finger over her lips. I'm going to bed, I said, in what I hoped was my normal voice. 
Me too, Stephanie said. Good night, Mom. Good night, dears. Night, Dad, I raised my voice as he entered the room. His eyes were dark. Usually by this point he'd be in a contrite mode, pleading for forgiveness. Hooded eyes were a bad omen. He brightened when he saw me, though, my face carefully arranged in a cheerful mask. Good night, girls, he said. We hurried down the hall to our separate rooms. Sleep came sporadically, despite my exhaustion. I was worried, of course, about this latest drama to upset our lives. We'd left him once before, when I was only six. Stephanie never knew the reason. She missed Dad and cried constantly. I didn't miss him. I didn't shed a single tear over our broken family. A few months later, when Mum announced we were going back, that's when I cried. The fight earlier that night had been one of an endless string of episodes. Intervals of peace never lasted for more than a few months. It was true, I was worried, but most of all I was embarrassed. I considered Carol to be a friend. She genuinely liked me, confided to me as if I was an adult. Now, after witnessing my parents in action, I wondered whether she'd ever ask me to babysit again. I played the scene over in my mind. How could I have been so unaware? I'd thought Carol was behaving strangely, insisting we dance together in the living room. Still, it was the most fun I'd had in a while. I'd been happy to linger with her, share in the afterglow of her evening's dancing. And all the while she'd been protecting me, keeping me from returning to the chaos of my home. How would I be able to face Carol or her husband? If we left town in the morning, I wouldn't have to face them. We'd be gone. Au revoir, baby. It was time for an escape. Frustrated by lack of sleep, I checked the time. 2 a.m. Might as well start packing. I got up and crossed the floor, pausing at my window. My room faced the backyard, overlooking the forest's edge. I lifted my curtain and froze. Despite the inadequate relief of the streetlights against the night sky, I knew it was him. I recognized his form as he closed the garage door. It made a whining noise, but not loud enough to wake a sleeping family. He hadn't turned the light on, but I was able to make out a shovel leaning against the white building. He bent over and picked up a bundle from the ground and hoisted it over his shoulder, then reached for the shovel. As his free hand grasped the tool, the loose bundle came apart, revealing a tiny ankle and foot. My eyes, accustomed to the faint glow of the streetlights, had no trouble seeing the white running shoe dangling against his dark shirt. He looked in my direction once. It seemed as if our eyes met, and for an instant fear stopped my heart, but then he turned away. Moving slowly so as not to make a sound, he stepped toward the forest. I watched until the darkness wrapped its arms around him and his petite burden. Mom was true to her word. We left in the morning. Stephanie didn't cry this time. She'd collected her own memories of family bliss, enough of them to harden her resolve. We took a cab to the city and from there got on a train. Mum bought lunch and snacks and crossword puzzles to keep us busy. He knew where to find us, of course. We received a flood of phone calls and letters pleading for forgiveness, begging us to come home, but we never went back. Mum sent only one answer, a letter telling him to leave us alone. Finally, he did. I never told anyone what I'd seen that night. Mom never mentioned it, and I took my lead from her. I suspect she knew. She'd probably noticed the unexplained bundle in the garage when they got home that night. She might have questioned Dad, asked what it was. I'm betting that's what the fight was about. It never occurred to me to turn him in, or that other children might die as a result of my silence. I blame my own naivete at the age of 17, my childish belief in unrelated, isolated incidents. And now, of course, it no longer matters. Eventually, he put his own unique end to the tragedy. He sat down one afternoon at her feet with a flask of holy wine for company, watching the cars fly up and down the highway. None of the drivers spotted our turn-off. Mary kept her vigil, 
making sure they all passed by. At dusk, our father put his flask into his pocket and blew his brains out with a hunting rifle. I hope he had the sense to ask forgiveness first. And that was Dancing with Carole from North on the Yellowhead and other crime stories. Thank you for joining me. And now, please give a big Dead to Rights welcome to author Rob Brunet. Rob writes crime fiction, often laced with dark humor. A creative writing instructor at George Brown College and co-host of Noir at the Bar, Toronto, Rob is a proud member of Sisters in Crime and acts as the regional vice president of Toronto and Southwest Ontario for Crime Writers of Canada. Before committing to writing, he ran a digital media boutique, producing award-winning web presence for film and TV, including Lost, Frank Miller's Sin City, and the cult series Alias. Rob loves the bush, beaches, and bonfires. He shares his time between Toronto and the Kawarthas with his wife, daughter, and son. Welcome, Rob. Hello, Rob. Welcome to Dead to Rights. It's Donna Carrick. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, we got a beautiful sunny Saturday going on in our area today. But it's uh, uh, warm indoors as one can expect when it's too cold outdoors. So. Yes, too cold to go outdoors, exactly. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for coming on Dead to Rights today. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I wanted to talk to you about... Uh, I'm, uh, quite a bit of your work, actually, I've got on my list to talk to you about, but starting with Stinking Rich. I love the title. I know a lot of people love the title. It just makes you smile when you hear it. My favorite blurb for that book is from Todd Robinson, and he says, to call the characters in Rob Brunet's fantastic debut the criminal underbelly would be to give them far too much credit. Underbelly is what these guys aspire to. <laughs> So can you tell us about your protagonist, uh, the highs and lows of character? I, I, I like to, uh, in, that, in that piece and in a lot of pieces, I like to uh, follow the crime and, um, and follow the criminals. And I have a, I've always had a thing for people who try really hard um, in spite of not necessarily understanding what it is they're trying to do. Um, and I don't think like most of the people that I stuffed that, stuffed into that book didn't think of themselves necessarily as criminals. They just thought of themselves as people who were doing the next thing they needed to do according to their own kind of twisted moral code. Um, uh, the, the protagonist, I, I had to, I think, make a little bit more approachable because it's kind of hard to root for a guy who pulls as many stupid stunts as he does on his way to uh, trying to make a buck uh, from people who are more seriously involved in crime than him. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, the rea and, and I guess the reality is that uh, whether it's he or any other characters, the truly stupid, though not necessarily criminally stupid things that, that uh, my characters end up doing are usually drawn from my personal direct experience. Um, <laughs> so, I like that. Killing people. <laughs> Not the, not the, you know, not the stuff you go to jail for. But now, are you sure you, you haven't, that, you haven't killed caught. anyone to the best of your knowledge? You haven't killed anyone? Are we going to get like a well, full confession here on, on the pod? Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 so, what is your character's name? Oh, uh, you know, speaking of just Danny. 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 Okay. I, 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 I uh, and there's actually also a Terry, and it was after the book, and he's sort of the sidekick at point. And after the book was written, that I was kind of told that you shouldn't have characters who have names that are very similar, and they're both very straight ahead uh, English, somewhat country names in the sense that they're, they're very I, Canadian. I mean, I, they're I, very I, Canadian names. If we've got any international listeners going on, uh, you should know that Danny, Terry, Rob, for that matter, and Donna—they're very uh, Canadian right. names. Yeah, and they can. Uh, but I think, which is why I, I like I wasn't going to turn it around and give them names that were unrepresentative of the people who they were, which was sort of people in the country. Yes, yes. 
Um, all I hear about Stinking Rich is that people just love it. It's, it got rave reviews when it came out. Um, so I went to your website to, to learn a little bit more about you and your work, and it tells me that you have a thing for the North Country. In particular, you spend time up in the Kawarthas. Um, where is Skinny Beach set, and uh, does the cottage and wilderness life feature in many of your stories? It does, and and although I, I I play with the geography when I need to for a story, like I'm not a, I'm not a purist in terms of setting. I, setting is very important to me, but at the end of the day, it's the setting that I'm creating with my imagination to help somebody else picture where the story is happening. So if I if, it, if a different geography or alignment of, of towns or things works better, then I then I do it. I don't worry about that. Yeah. Um, but but Skinny's Beach. Um, uh, actually is uh, on Constance Bay um, uh, outside of Ottawa okay. um, on, on the Ottawa River and, it, and that's actually very as closely described as I could to a, um, a beach that I actually grew up on Okay. and, so I, and, and in fact a whole lot of that story and, and the, uh, the characters in it and most of the events in it um, are are as accurately depicted as I could, and then and people tell me, "But it's such a mean story." And I was like, "Yeah, well, like, people can be mean." Yeah, they can. They absolutely especially, can. Especially teenagers who feel that their space is being stepped on by people who are not teenagers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, teenagers in particular can be mean, but uh, people in general can. Uh, something that a lot of people don't think about: uh, mainlander Canadians. We love our beaches, and. Um, I was actually born near the ocean and uh, spent a lot of my childhood near the ocean, but I spent the bulk of my life in mainland and central Canada, and I still love the beach. Um, we've got beaches all over. People don't realize that. Yeah. No, it's, when you're, again, I mean, my knee-jerk response to your, how is it going, and my comment on the cold, when you live in a place that it is cold half of the year, the other half of the year you're going to find as warm a spot as you can. You yes. can see the beach for that. Yeah, nice sandy sunspot, exactly. Um, yeah. you, you've, you've got something in your resume called Noir at the Bar. Can you tell me about that? What does that entail? Um, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's an event that was uh, originally started by uh, Peter Rosofsky, who's a Montrealer, uh, ex-Montrealer living in Philadelphia. And, um, uh, it was picked up in New York by Todd Robinson and uh, and in L.A. by Eric Beatner and before that by Jed Ayers, I believe, in uh, St. Louis. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, um, uh, and it's now happening in cities not only throughout North America, but also um, in the U.K., I guess. Um, and I'll, I'll get, you know, someone would beat me up and say I'm not using, using the U.K. correctly because it doesn't include necessarily the countries that we're referring to where <laughs> Noir at the Bar is happening. Um, and if I was at a Noir at the Bar, they'd call me out rudely and loudly because what it is is basically a bunch of people who get together in a bar, uh, six to eight authors typically read short, gritty crime fiction, uh, usually in two or three sets to leave lots of room in between for people to socialize and make use of the bar. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's sort of, sort of like a reading except it's it's much more social than that. Mm -hmm. And in Toronto, we, um, we, we're, we're overdue for one now. There'll be another one uh, shortly this spring, but uh, we try to do them about three times a year, four if we're lucky. Uh, and it ends up being sort of 40, 50, 60 people who uh, have a different opportunity to get together in a bar. And, 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 uh, where, where do you meet? What bar are you meeting at? So we, 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 we've met at a couple of them. The one that, uh, geez, I, I, uh, it's terrible that I say something that the name is not on the tip of my tongue, at, at Young and Davisville. Okay. Uh, and I should, I, should, I should have the name, but I can't. Oh, maybe you'll send I'm, it to I'm me. Like, maybe like you'll like send it right to now. me when you've got it at your fingertips. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to know, yeah. Uh, it sounds really like a lot of fun. Uh, what kind of characters do you get turning out there here in the Toronto scene? Um, well, the, 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 so... There are people who are uh, very well published, uh, successful Toronto authors who sometimes read and who sometimes come to listen to others read. There are people who are new to it, 
and we usually have one or two people who, uh, for whom, if this isn't their first reading, it's one of their first readings, uh, and or they've, you know, perhaps only had a short story published, they're just getting into it, and trying to broaden the, not only the scope of the people coming out to the events, but also uh, the opportunity for people to hear Yes. Um, stories that they're not necessarily going to run into otherwise. Yeah, because, you know, stories are stories are meant to be heard. You know, reading is one thing. All of us writers love to read. We really do. But um, stories are originally meant to be heard, and there's nothing like hearing a, a good story. Like, it, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah. No, it definitely is. Yeah. Now, uh, Stinking Rich, when it first came out, it made a huge splash, and... Um, I know it's hard to follow a really highly popular first book, but what are you working on right now? Have you got a novel underway? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like I've been telling people for all the years since the Rich. I know, I, I'm, I'm hoisting you on this petard of mine right here, you know. Um, <laughs> exactly. You're supposed to tell me so, about uh, Night of yeah, the Flood. Yeah. Tell me about Night of the Flood. <laughs> so Night of, Night of the Flood... Um, uh, thank you for asking what night is Oh, night, you're night very night. welcome, Rob. Part, we did part, not rehearse part, this part, at all, yeah. people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, night of the Flood is a book coming out in March, edited by uh, Ed Amar and Sarah Chen, um, um, that contains um, a, a handful of different stories by different voices, so a bunch of different authors. I'm one of them. The others are... Um, the others are not ducking questions about the next book because they're far more prolific than I am. <laughs> um, and successful. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, um, it, it's a story about uh, a fictitious town in Pennsylvania where a, a, a dam bursts, but the dam does not burst uh, accidentally. It's blown up uh, as a protest against the uh, uh, capital punishment of a... Um, uh, a character who uh, had uh, self had killed some someone in self defense. Okay. Um, uh, or or self defense or retribution for for a for a for a, um, uh, a violent crime against them. So that with that backstory, everybody tells a different story um, about bringing their own characters to the table, weaving them together as the waters crush through the town. Oh, okay. Um, so some authors brought their series characters, some created a new characters for these short stories, and then the, and then the stories kind of touch each other on the way through. So what you end up with is a pretty uh, heavy, dark, fast-paced um, collection of stories, all happening in the same twelve-hour uh, period. I love uh, this, and this is a this is a new style of writing novels too, where. Um, some of the most popular writers right now are approaching their novels from these multiple points of view. So there's an event, there's a murder, or there's a suspicious death of some kind, and how does each character approach that? What was their involvement and what was their point of view in it? So this sounds like it's very much like that, really intriguing. Yeah, it's, and it's uh, been very... It, it, it came together surprisingly smoothly for... Uh, and quickly for that kind of project, and, it, and it, uh, I think that um, Ed and Sarah did a wonderful job of uh, yanking it together into, into... And the editors are, uh, is, can say. you say their names again? Uh, uh, Ed Amar and Sarah Chen. And Thank coming you. coming out from Down and Out Books in, uh, in March. Down and Out um, Books in March, okay, yeah. excellent. That's terrific. Yeah, um, I guess I should, yeah, and I should mention that most of the authors uh, contribute regularly to um, Thrill Begins, where we're... We're, we we run a, a blog called uh, Murderers Row. Murderers Row. Sort of, okay. Yeah. So if you yeah. Google the blog Murderers Row, you're going to find Rob and a lot of the other writers who are appearing in Night of the Flood. I know that when you're a writer, you're you're constantly learning, you're self teaching, you're uh, facing trial and error. Is there any tip that you can share with our listeners, or a series of tips even? Um. Yeah, I'm going to go back to your, 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 your I'm going to answer that question by going back to your question uh, two ago, which is was, was about, so what are you writing next, or what are you working on? Um, and, that, and so, uh, and, I, and I'm really trying to hold myself to account for this. It's, uh, and so many people have said it in better ways. Uh, I think Chuck Wendig said, finish your shit. Um, <laughs> uh, because it's, um, and I, I encourage my students in my uh, creative writing classes 
to uh, even as you're working on novels, it's like you know, you, you know, you've got some short stories in, in the drawer, and whether or not you consider yourself to be a short story writer, uh, finish some of those, send them in, get them on submission. Um, uh, for this, the for all of the reasons, and it's not nobody makes it as a short story writer, but it's 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 exposure, it's causing you to to actually put a nail in something and say that's done, and it's a, a skill that. I think it really applies to uh, strong novel writing because the people that I see doing some of the best work regularly finish their novels and say it's done. Yes. Um, as a thing, I've worked on three different manuscripts over the last three years, and I'm, I'm now almost done one. Um, Good. And <laughs> I mean, it's 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 you know, it's in its fifth revision. Um, and and that's all good, but it would be good if I if I uh, if, if I instead had one of the three um, actually done completed behind me and was working on the second one. Yeah, and that comes uh, from a plethora of ideas because I face the same thing. And for me, it's not about being hugely prolific. Like I know some writers are just churning them out, and um, it doesn't say anything about the quality. Some of them are great writers, and I love reading them, and I'm glad they churn them out. But not everybody gets to the same level of being prolific that's not really what what we're saying here we're saying when you start it finish it because it teaches you something finishing it plus it gives you yeah. something you can put out into the world that represents you and it also establishes for you as an artist or as a writer that this is what you do you know this is this is what you yeah. do. You are a writer, and therefore you have written and you have finished. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah, agree. Let's move on to the next one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Exactly. And like, if the one that you're working on now sucks, let it suck in completion. Yeah. You know, because there's no yeah. point letting it suck partly completed, because you you'd never know. I mean, maybe it doesn't suck the way you think. You know? <laughs> I think suck is a word that writers just loved a lot, John, too, don't they? <laughs> it's one of those words. I, I agree with your tips, absolutely. And um, I want to hear more about Noir on the Bar, so I'm hoping that you're going to actually send me some news on it when it comes up. And uh, I'm also going to be watching for A Night of the Flood, which you said the name of the imprint? Uh, down and out books. Down and Out Books, I love that. That makes me think of Down and Out in London and Paris, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I, it's probably where it came from, I'm sure, yeah. I imagine, yeah. No, yeah. No. yeah. So we're yeah. going to be dreaming about summer, and we're going to be dreaming about the beach. Do you have any travels on the agenda? Thriller Fest um, in New York in July, and then um, Bouchacan in the fall. So Bouchacan in the fall. Helps. Where is yeah, Bouchacan in uh, this year? St. Petersburg, I think. St. Petersburg, okay, okay. Florida, not For Russia. <laughs> you had me there for a minute, you know. <laughs> yeah. I haven't been yeah. to Bouchacan yet because it's often uh, it's often in the um, Canadian Thanksgiving weekend. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I've had that. I've had to return early a couple of times because I didn't have to cook the turkey those times. So. Oh, that's lucky, yeah. <laughs> it also happens to be my husband's birthday, so I can never get out of that weekend. Like the weekend is really kind of given over to family, so that's been a that's been my cross to bear. What can I say? You know. Anyways, Rob, I'm looking forward to a lot more of your writing. So thank you very much for joining us on Dead to Rights, and uh, let me know what you're doing next, please. Thanks for having me on. Really, uh, 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 enjoy talking to you. The same okay. here. So we had a couple of great tips for you this week on Dead to Rights. First of all, from Rob Brunet, he tells us, finish your work. What you start, you should finish. And that is so important because even if you're working on something that you're really not totally fond of, if you finish it, then you can move on free and clear to the next thing and not have doubts. If it really sucks, that ah put it under the bed or burn it or throw it in the trash. But if it doesn't really suck, then polish it up and work with it. But you need to have something that can represent you out there in the industry. So you've got to finish something. I'd like to send a big thanks to Rob Brunet for joining us today on Dead to Rights, the podcast. You can find Dead to Rights at deadtorights.ca or at our Facebook page. Our Twitter handle is at deadtorightspod. We'd love to hear from you at carrickpublishing.com 
or at our Carrick Publishing Facebook page. If you have a question you'd like either myself to answer or you would like me to put to our authors, please post it at our Dead to Rights Facebook page, and I'll be sure to ask the question. You can find me, Donna Carrick, on Twitter at Donna underscore Carrick or at my website, DonnaCarrick.com. If you're a published author and would like to join our listeners on the pod, contact me at CarrickPublishing at Rogers.com and say, schedule me for an interview. Join us next week when we rub shoulders with Kathy Astolfo, a very funny lady and a great author. Our Dead to Rights theme song is Eyes of Gold, composed and performed by Ted Carrick, who also brought us the original story scoring music. Thanks for joining us. See you next week. Dusty road, a man alone. His vital signs go on hold. And I don't know what you've been told. But the years have turned my eyes gold. And I told you what you told me we'd never be in the same boat for free yet it rides let it rock